Good morning. Welcome to one and all. Please avail yourselves of coffee and water and refreshments and then come find a seat at one of the tables. Welcome to New Directions in Edwards Studies, a lecture series sponsored by our Jonathan Edwards Center and very importantly this time the Henry Center as well. Uh, we're glad that you're here. Looking forward to a good lecture from Dr. Crisp in just a minute and some good conversation after he's done with all of you. Uh, in just a minute, I'll give you a formal introduction of Dr. Crisp. Then he'll come and give his talk. And when he's done, I'll return to the platform and moderate a time of questions and answers and discussion with all of you. We have until 12.15 to do all of these things. At 12.30, Dr. Crisp has another appointment on campus. So I'll, I'll try to be strict in ending at 12.15, but maybe at that time, if you haven't met him yet and you'd like to meet him, we'll give you a couple of minutes for that before we whisk him away to his next appointment. But thank you very much for coming. Look forward to having conversation with all of you. Oliver D. Crisp is the most influential constructive theologian at work today, using Edwards as a major interlocutor. He serves as professor of systematic theology at Fuller Theological Seminary and as a professorial fellow at the Institute for Analytic and Exegetical Theology in the University of St. Andrews. He's authored and edited many books, a couple with yours truly. We've been friends for many years, and it's always a lot of fun for me when Oliver visits Trinity. He's been here a number of times in the past. The books that Oliver has written that have the most to do with his visit today are Jonathan Edwards and the Metaphysics of Sin, Ashgate, 2005, Jonathan Edwards on God and Creation, Oxford, 2012, and most recently, Jonathan Edwards, An Introduction to His Thought, co-written with Kyle Strobel and published by Erdman's just this year, 2018. He's coming to speak to us today on Jonathan Edwards on Creation. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris back to our lectern. Uh, well, that's a very generous introduction. Um, being English, I'm never quite sure what to say when people give you these effusive introductions, but I'm very grateful. Thank you very much, uh, Doug, and thank you for the invitation to be back here with you. It's a great honor for me to be able to um, come and bore you all rigid for some period of time on a, a, a topic uh, that I am somewhat obsessed with. Um, my children roll their eyes when the name Jonathan Edwards comes up at the dinner table. <laughs> so I'm sure, you, in a way, you're helping them because then I won't, be, I won't feel the need to constantly uh, tease them about Jonathan Edwards over dinner. Uh, in this paper, I want to consider an aspect of Jonathan Edwards' understanding of God and creation that's more usually connected with the work of medieval theologians like Thomas Aquinas. This is the issue of God's relation to creation. Aquinas had a well-known answer to the query, what is God's relation to the creation? He replied that God is not really related to the world he creates. The relation from the Godward side of things is a merely logical or conceptual one. It cannot be a real relation because such an understanding of God's connection with creation would render the created order somehow necessary for the divine life, the inevitable output of God's nature, so to speak. And this would jeopardize divine aseity, that is, God's metaphysical and psychological independence of the created order. As Aquinas puts it in his discussion of the relations of the divine persons in the Godhead and the Summa Theologiae, and I quote him, as the creature proceeds from God in diversity of nature, God is outside the order of the whole creation nor does any relation to the creature arise from his nature. For he does not produce the creature by necessity of his nature, but by his intellect and will. Therefore, there is no real relation in God to the creature, whereas in creatures, there is a real relation to God, because creatures are contained under the divine order, and their very nature entails dependence on God." It is Aquinas' settled view that God's relation to the creation is one of logical priority, whereas from the creaturely side of things, the relation is real because we depend upon God for our existence. 
This is a fundamental theological question because it touches upon the reason for creating the world and it distinguishes the way in which we're related to the one who is the creator of all things in heaven and earth. Much depends on the answer we give to this question, even though it isn't much discussed in contemporary theology. Well, what does Jonathan Edwards have to say about this matter? In the first part of my talk, I'll briefly set out the question itself, drawing on the work of Thomas Aquinas in particular. Then in a second section, I'll consider what Edwards says about these issues. We shall see that Edwards' theological commitments imply that God is really related to the world he creates. God necessarily creates a world out of nothing, yet according to Edwards, this doesn't infringe divine freedom because God himself is the source of this necessity and because of the nature of the necessity in question. Nor does it imperil divine aseity, sovereignty, or ultimacy either. Thus, Edwards represents an interesting alternative to Aquinas. His solution deals with the worry that motivated Aquinas' views on God's relation to creation, that is, jeopardizing divine aseity, whilst allowing that God really is related to his creatures. That's, so that's where we're going. Let's begin then uh, by setting out the issue, Aquinas on God's relation to creation. Denying that God has a real relation to the created order isn't intuitive for most Christians today. The Roman Catholic theologian Catherine Mary Lacagna, speaking for many when, uh, on this matter, writes the following, and I quote her, the life of God does not belong to God alone because of God's outreach to the creature. God is said to be essentially relational, ecstatic, fecund, alive as passionate love. Divine life is therefore also our life. For this reason, she thinks that a right understanding of the doctrine of God, and especially of the Trinity, denies that God is, as she says, in isolation from everything other than God. And this, from a certain point of view, is just what the Thomist picture requires. However, even if we don't think that the Thomist claim isolates God from creation, it certainly seems to jar with our intuitions about the way in which God creates and sustains the world, especially if we're readers of scripture. William Lane Craig voices similar worries from a Protestant perspective. He puts it bluntly when he says this, it seems inconceivable that God's causal relation to the world and the events and things in it could be regarded as anything other than a real relation. Indeed, God's being related to the world as cause to effect seems to be a paradigm example of a real relation. For consider some of the apparently counterintuitive theological consequences that follow from denying that God is really related to the creation. It means that Christ is not really related to his mother. It means that God is not really related to us as our savior. And it even means that God does not bear the real relation of being the creator of creatures. All of this, on the, on the face of it anyway, seems absurd. So why would anyone think that God fails to have a real relation to creation? In a recent treatment of John Webster's Protestant Thomist defense of the view that God has no real relation to creation, Kevin Van Hooser points out that one important reason for thinking that God doesn't have a real relation to creation is that any such relation would be constitutive of God's nature. Suppose with classical theists like Aquinas or Webster that God is without any metaphysical composition whatsoever. He may have real relations within himself constitutive of the divine persons, what Aquinas calls the subsistent relations that distinguish the divine persons in the Godhead, but he cannot have a real relation to creation because that would be constitutive of who he is, as the real relations that a Trinitarian persons are, in an important sense, constitutive of who he is. Aquinas says that any relation that predicates of God a real relation to creation jeopardizes divine simplicity. It also imperils divine aseity. Since neither of these things, on his view, are theologically tolerable, God's relation to creation must be a notional or conceptual one, not a real one. Aquinas clarifies this in his work De Veritate, where in an article on the relation of the word to the created order, he writes this, and here's a quotation. Whenever two things are related to one another in such a way that one depends on the other, but the other does not depend on it, there is a real relation in the dependent member, but in the independent member, the relation is merely one of reason, simply because one thing cannot be understood as being related to another without that other thing being understood as being related to it. The notion of such a relation becomes clear if we consider knowledge which depends on what is known 
though the latter does not depend on it. Consequently, since all creatures depend on God, but he doesn't depend on them, there are real relations in creatures referring them to God. The opposite, the opposite relation in God to creatures, however, are merely conceptual relations. But because names are signs of concepts, certain names we use for God uh, imply a relation to creatures, even though, as we've said, this relation is a merely conceptual one. The only real relations of God are those by which the divine persons are distinguished from each other. So that's what Thomas says. From this, we can see the following picture. God is said by Aquinas to be merely conceptually or notionally related to the creation. The reason for this distinction depends at least in part on other theological commitments about the divine nature, specifically divine simplicity and divine aseity. For if God is without composition, then he cannot have properties or accidents such as the property of being the creator of the world. And if God exists asse, then he cannot be dependent upon his creation, which includes the dependency that a real relation implies, because such a relation ties God to his creation in a way that jeopardizes his metaphysical and psychological independence of his creatures. These constitute the historic Thomistic reasons for denying God has a real relation to his creation. So with this in mind, we can turn to consider Edwards. Now we've got the problem. Let's see what Edwards has to say. So let's think about Edwards on the metaphysics of creation. Towards, although towards the end of his life, he wrote a dissertation on God's ultimate purpose in creating the world, unlike Aquinas, Edwards didn't write about the particular issue with which we're concerned in any systematic or sustained way. Instead, we must glean what his view amounts to from assembling what he says about several related issues in a number of different places in his corpus and drawing a conclusion based on this evidence. When taken together, Edwards' views on, on related issues imply or give rise to a particular view of God's relation to creation. Now, to see this, let's sketch out the ontological picture with which Edwards is working on the relationship between God and creation. And then we can fill in the particular theological claims Edwards makes that are relevant to our question. And that will give us some intellectual context in order to address the issue of God's relation to the created order. First, then, let's consider the ontological picture that informs Edwards' theology. As is widely known, Edwards is an idealist who holds to a doctrine of immaterialism. That is, the idea that all that exists are minds and their ideas, matter in the material world, as it were, being a fiction. In his early unpublished notebook, The Mind, Edwards writes this. Here's a little quotation. And indeed, the secret lies here. That which truly is the substance of all bodies is the infinitely exact and precise and perfectly stable idea in God's mind, together with his stable will that the same shall gradually be communicated to us and to other minds according to certain fixed and exact established methods and laws. Or in somewhat different language, the infinitely exact and precise divine idea together with an answerable, perfectly exact, precise and stable will with respect to correspondent communications to created minds and effects on their minds. A correlate of this in Edwards' philosophy is a species of metaphysical anti-realism. God is the only true substance, says Edwards. We exist as created substance in, in some transient and radically dependent sense, but we're not subsistent like God. That is, we don't have independent existence as God does. In the language of scholastic theology, we're not, fundamentally, we're not fundamental substances, strictly speaking. Only God is such a fundamental substance. We exist as created substances that are like projections from God ad extra, so to speak, to which are communicated various ideas of our bodies and the world around us. Material objects are just such collocated bundles of ideas and percepts. So a table or a lectern is a collocated bundle of ideas or properties, including its shape, its mass, and perceptible properties like its hardness, its smoothness, and so on. By contrast, you and I, according to Edwards, are created spirits. We are agents. As, Ad as Edwards puts it at one point, a mind or spirit is nothing else but consciousness and what is included in it. This picture is metaphysically anti-realist because Edwards thinks that all that exists is mind-dependent and in some fundamental sense, divine mind-dependent. There's no material world independent of God's mind or created minds. Or as Edwards puts puts it in his notebook of being, the universe exists nowhere but in the divine mind. 
Now, to this rather exotic ontological picture, we must add four related theological notions. These are Edwards's account of the necessity of creation, Edwards's rather unusual understanding of continuous creation out of nothing, his doctrine of occasionalism, and his panentheism. Let's take them in turn. To begin with, let's consider Edwards's views on the necessity of creation. He maintained that God is so constituted that he acts from a moral necessity in all that he does. Hence, in his uh, treatise on the freedom of the will, he writes this, God himself has the highest possible freedom, according to the true and proper meaning of the term, and that he is the highest possible respect and in the highest possible respect an agent and active in the exercise of his infinite holiness, though he acts therein in the highest degree necessarily, and his actions of this kind are in the highest, most absolutely perfect manner, virtuous and praiseworthy, and so for this very reason, because they are most perfectly necessary. This moral necessity springs from God's nature. He says, it's no disadvantage, or in fact he says, tis, tis no disadvantage or dishonor to a being necessarily to act in the most excellent and happy manner from the necessary perfection of his own nature. And in his dissertation on God's end in creation, he adds this, this propensity in God to diffuse himself may be considered a property to himself diffused or to his own glory existing in its emanation a respect to himself, or an infinite propensity to and delight in his own glory, is that which causes him to incline to its being abundantly diffused and to delight in the emanation of it. God looks on the communication of himself and the emanation of the infinite glory and good that are in himself to belong to the fullness and completeness of himself as though he were not in his most complete and glorious state without it. You've got to love the, the uh, early modern English that he's using. It is, he says, as though he were not in his most complete and glorious state without the creation, despite the fact that God's aim in creation is not to bring about creatures, but to bring his own self-enlargement and glorification about, to use as Edwards' terminology. Edwards also thinks that God is essentially a creator and must create in a way analogous to the artist who we might think is essentially an artist and must make art. As William Rowe puts it, commenting on Edwards, given his necessary perfections, for Edwards, God is morally unable to do anything other than what he sees to be best. God is morally unable to do otherwise because although God is able to do otherwise if he chooses to, he cannot choose to do other than the best. Now, second, there's the matter of creation out of nothing. Edwards clearly endorses this doctrine, although he speaks of God emanating the world in his dissertation concerning the end for which God created the world, as we just saw. There are many places in which he says that God creates from nothing. Indeed, Edwards is committed to a doctrine of continuous creation. God is continuously creating the world out of nothing at each moment. So in his treatise on original sin, written towards the end of his life, he says this, it will certainly follow from these things, in other words, from a consideration of whether God is constantly upholding the world by his power, that God's preserving created things in being is perfectly equivalent to a continued creation or to his creating these things out of nothing at each moment of their existence. He goes on to say this, it will follow from what has been observed that God's upholding created substance or causing its existence in each successive moment is altogether equivalent to an immediate production out of nothing at each moment. Now, on the face of it, these two claims seem inconsistent or incommensurate. How can God emanate the world and also continuously create the world out of nothing? The answer to this conundrum lies in his immaterialism, I suggest. He maintains that the world is an immediate divine communication from God's self outwards, so to speak, a projection, if you like, of minds and their ideas that's renewed moment by moment. These ideas have an exemplar in the divine mind, but they're not generated from, from some kind of stuff. They're not even generated from a kind of nothingness from which they spring. Rather, they're simply generated moment by moment from the divine mind as a projection or communication outwards or ad extra 
And in this connection, we should compare what Edwards writes about these matters in his early notebook on the mind. He says this, since all material existence is only idea, the question may be asked, in what sense may those things be said to exist which is opposed and yet are in no actual idea of any created minds? I answer, they exist only in uncreated idea. But how do they exist otherwise than they did from all eternity? For they always were in uncreated idea and divine appointment. I answer, they did exist from all eternity in uncreated idea, as did everything else, and as they do at present, but not in created idea. These things are ideas in the divine mind, in other words. Third and closely related to the foregoing, Edwards espouses the doctrine of occasionalism, according to which God is the only real cause. Creaturely actions are merely the occasions of God's bringing about a particular action. Consider, for example, Original Sin, his treatise on Original Sin, where Edwards says that the identity of created substances across time is, to quote him, merely dependent identity, dependent on the pleasure and sovereign constitution of him that worketh all in all. And later in the same passage, he goes on to say, it should be remembered what nature is in created things and what the established course of nature is, that as has been observed already, it is nothing separate from the agency of God. And that as Dr. Taylor says, Dr. Taylor is his interlocutor, God, the original of all being, is the only cause of all natural effects. And he goes on to say this. It will follow from what has been observed that God's upholding of created substance or causing of his existence at each successive moment is altogether equivalent to an immediate production out of nothing at each moment. For it appears that the divine constitution, this is important, the divine constitution is what makes truth in affairs of this nature. Strong stuff. Yet whether or what sort of occasionalism Edwards endorses remains a contested issue in the scholarly literature, as some of the scholars in this room know only too well. Recently, Mark Hamilton has suggested that Edwards held that God causes all created perceptions immediately, that is, occasionally, but that Edwards still speaks of secondary causation with respect to created minds. In other words, on Hamilton's reading of Edwards, God creates creaturely minds which are independent of God in some sense after they're created and may act as causal agents in their own right, but he communicates to them all the percepts of the world around them immediately. In this way, Hamilton suggests a kind of mixed modes account of causation in Edwards. God creates us to be causal agents, but at the same time, it's not true of the ideal world in which uh, he places us. It's rather like having a kind of virtual world, like that of science fiction dystopias, The Matrix, or the forthcoming film Ready Player One. I don't know if you've seen the trailers. We are causal agents, but the world in which we act is caused and sustained by another agent. In the case of The Matrix, this, this other agent is the machine hive mind that has enslaved humanity. In the case of the Ernest Klein novel Ready Player One, now a blockbuster, it's the virtual world of oasis to which humans resort as the actual world falls into disarray. Similarly, on Hamilton's reading of Edwards, we're causal agents that exist in the virtual world, as it were, generated moment by moment by God's act of continuous creation. The world itself and all its content, apart from created minds, is caused by God. Our agency is therefore limited, but real. The world in which we live and move is ideal and generated that is caused by uh, divine action immediately. Now, although this is an intriguing way of thinking about Edwards' position and makes sense of the many places Edwards speaks with the vulgar, as it were, about secondary causation, it does face some conceptual difficulties. Chief among these is that Edwards' doctrine of continuous creation entails that nothing persists for long enough to constitute a moral or causal agent. The charming irony, as Philip Quinn calls it, means that for Edwards, even something like the fall of Adam is not an action that can be completed by numerically one entity across time, because according to Edwards' continuous doctrine of continuous creation, the Adam who reached for the fruit and the Adam who ate the fruit are numerically distinct individuals existing as part of numerically distinct world stages created and segued together by divine convention. In fact, no action that takes time is committed by numerically the same entity, for the stages that compose a given four-dimensional entity are, on Edwards' view, momentary. 
So it looks like Edwards is committed to a very strong and consistent form of occasionalism, all the way down, we might say, a kind of global occasionalism. Fourth, there's the matter of panentheism. Some theologians like Charles Hodge in the 19th century have worried that Edwards' metaphysics presses him in the direction of pantheism. Now, there are good reasons to be worried about this, reasons having to do with internal tensions in Edwards' metaphysics, but for present purposes, uh, let's be charitable and treat Edwards as a panentheist, not a pantheist. Although the phrase all in godism, or allen Gottslehrer, the, uh, which is where panentheism comes from, postdates Edwards, it does capture something essential about his understanding of the God-world relation. For he says quite clearly, God is the sum of all being, and there is no being without his being. All things are in him, and he in all. That's what Edward says. Now, as I previously intimated, Edward thinks that human beings, like other creatures, are something like projections from the divine mind that have a liminal and ephemeral existence. However, created minds do not persist through time from one moment to the next, at least not wholly from one moment to the next. Rather, created minds, along with everything else that is created, exist for merely a moment. God is constantly creating. This is his doctrine of continuous creation. The world is but a momentary stage, like a flickering photographic image in an old-fashioned roll of film projected onto the silver screen of a movie theater. You can tell I live in LA, can't you? Just as the movie is made up of many such cinema cinematographic images with incremental changes from one image to the next, which are run together in the movie projector so that we see the motion, project, the, the motion picture projected onto the silver screen in front of us, so also God creates a particular world stage like a cinematographic image that exists in the present momentarily only to be replaced by a numerically distinct but qualitatively near identical second momentary world stage that has incremental differences built into it. This in turn is replaced by further momentary world stages and so on and so on seriatim. God arranges these momentary world stages as he sees fit according to his will and wisdom and in so doing he ordains that this or that particular collection of world stages uh, of world stage bound entities should be treated as a single entity across time. Well, that's a lot to swallow. Let's take stock. On the basis of Edwards' metaphysics, we have a picture in which the created order is projected or emanated from the divine mind ad extra that is radically dependent upon God for its existence and that comprises ideas and created minds. He is an idealist, anti-realist, immaterialist. See if you can say that quickly. It's a bit of a tongue twister. On the basis of this ontological framework, he constructs a version of panentheism that includes a doctrine of continuous creation and occasionalism, with the creation as the necessary output of the divine nature. What does this say about Edwards' way of thinking about the real relation between God and creation with which we began this talk? Well, first, we can be sure that Edwards thought that creatures have a real relation to their creator. We are radically dependent upon divine action for our continued existence because we are parts of the world stages God emanates and segues together seriatim according to his own will and good purpose. In fact, for Edwards, we persist through time by means of momentary counterpart stages, the content of which is caused directly by God moment by moment. However, what we really want to know from Edwards is what relation God bears to his creatures. Given his immaterialist anti-realism, his occasionalism, his pantheism, and his understanding of the necessity of creation, it appears that God is really related to the creation. For what is the created order but something akin to a motion picture projected from God, ad extra, that is an output of the essentially creative divine nature? Like a motion picture, the creation is an ephemeral thing. Also, like a motion picture, it is, as it were, projected from God. Finally, like a motion picture, God is its author and director and causes and oversees all that takes place in the world like an author or director does. No creature causes what obtains in the world any more than a character in a book causes the actions they perform to obtain. They're merely the occasions of the causal efficacy of the author. Just so with creation on Edwards' way of thinking. But this means that God is really related to the creation. 
He cannot be merely logically or conceptually related to what he creates because he is immediate, the immediate and necessary cause of what obtains. Considering this connect connection, what Edwards says uh, back in uh, his dissertation on God ends, God's End in Creation, which was written towards the end of his life. Here's a quotation. This is one of my favorite quotations from Edwards. The emanate, this is a bit of a long quotation, but you can never have enough Edwards, am I right? The emanation or communication of the divine fullness, consisting in the knowledge of God, love to God, and joy in God, has a relation indeed both to God and the creature. But it has relation to God as its fountain, as it is an emanation from God. And as the communication itself, or thing communicated, is something divine, something of God, something of his internal fullness, as the water in the stream is something of the fountain, and as the beams are of the sun. And again, they have relation to God as they have respect to him as their object. For the knowledge communicated is the knowledge of God, and so God is the object of the knowledge. And the love communicated, com communicated is the love of God, so God is the object of that love. And the happiness communicated is the joy of God, and so the object of the joy communicated. In the creature's knowing, esteemed, loving, rejoicing, and praising God, the glory of God is both exhibited and acknowledged, and his fullness is received and returned. Here is both an emanation and a remination. The refulgence shines upon and into the creature and is reflected back to the luminary. The beams of glory come from God and are something of God and are refunded back again to their original. So that the whole is of God and in God and to God, and God is the beginning, middle, and end of this affair. That's Edwards. The communication of the divine fullness in creation is something divine, he says, an emanation, a communication. In communic communicating himself in this matter, God's fullness is received and returned, according to Edwards. God emanates something of himself to his creatures who remanate it back to God as they participate in the divine life, so that, as he says, the whole is of God, in God, to God. It's difficult to see how this could not be understood in terms of a real relation from the Godward point of view. It is, we might think, a kind of ideal yet real relation in which God communicates himself to creatures by means of an emanation ad extra. This might be thought to jeopardize divine aseity, which is just what Aquinas and his disciples have worried about. Yet Edwards clearly endorsed divine aseity in the very work in which he speaks of God emanating himself in creation in this dissertation. And this is what Edwards says. That no notion of God's last end in the created world is agreeable to reason which would truly imply or infer any indigence insufficiently and mutability in God or any dependence of the creator on the creature for any part of his perfection or happiness. Because it's evident by both Scripture and reason that God is infinitely, eternally, unchangeable and independently glorious and happy, that he stands in no need of and cannot be profited by or receive anything from the creature, or be truly hurt, or be the subject of any suffering or impair of his glory and felicity from any other being. Moreover, if the creature receives its all from God entirely and perfectly, how is it possible that it should have anything to add to God to make him in any respect more than he was before and so the creator become dependent on the creature. That's what Edwards says. Although God creates from a moral necessity of his own nature, he is the source of his action. And it is his infinite and eternal delight to see the exercise of his power in self-enlargement by means of the emanation of creation, creation ad extra, to borrow Edwards' rather quaint language from the dissertation. Moreover, as we've seen, God continuously creates ex nihilo. So God is not metaphysically dependent on the creation for his existence. He is logically and conceptually prior to creation and cannot be affected by his creatures, which are radically metaphysically dependent upon him moment by moment. God isn't psychologically dependent on the creation for his happiness either. God's ultimate aim in all his works is his own self-glorification. We are a necessary means to that end, consequent upon God's eternal decision to glorify himself through creation. Nevertheless, if God had wanted to glorify himself and his works by some other means, some other creation perhaps, he would have done so. But he did not desire this because, on Edward's thinking, this would have been a less optimal state of affairs than the one that obtains in the creation of this world. 
In this connection, it's also worth pointing out uh, that Edwards clearly endorses God's absolute sovereignty and ultimacy over creation. That is, he clearly believed that God is in absolute control of the created order, which is absolute divine sovereignty. He also holds that all that exists other than God exists through God, which is divine ultimacy. Such divine ultimacy is a feature of Edwards' idealist version of theistic conceptualism, the view according to which God creates all that exists from exemplars or divine ideas. But can Edwards have his metaphysical cake and eat it? Can he hold that God has a real relation to creation, as well as saying that God exists as, say, as an absolute sovereign who is metaphysically ultimate? Well, we can reconstruct Edwards' reasoning to this end uh, in, a, in a set of kind of theses, if you like, and I'm just going to give you those theses uh, in numbered statements to try and make it as clear as possible. So number one, God is not the world. God and the world are distinct entities. We might call this the anti-pantheism thesis. Number two, the world is the necessary product of God's essential creativity. We could call this the necessity of creation thesis. Number three, the created world is ideal. It is a communication or projection of the divine mind ad extra. Let's call this the anti-realist immaterialism thesis. Number four, God continuously creates world stages that comprise the created order out of nothing. God eternally decrees that no created thing persists through time. Each moment of creation is numerically distinct from the previous one. God constitutes from these many world stages one four-dimensional entity that we might call the world, in capital letters, the created order. He makes truth in this matter. Let's call that the four-dimensionalist continuous creation thesis. And fifthly, God is the sole causal agent, the efficient cause of all that comes to pass. That's the occasionalist thesis. Sixthly, God creates the world as a set of stable ideas according to divine exemplars. All things apart from God are generated through God, the divine ultimacy thesis. Seventh, God's actions are free in a compatibilist sense. In other words, his freedom is compatible with determinism. He is the source of his action. He acts in accordance with his nature, and he acts with the ultimate goal of self-glorification. Let's call this seventh thesis the theistic compatibilism thesis. And then finally, number eight, God is metaphysically and psychologically independent of the world he creates, which is the divine aseity thesis. Now, these theses do not appear to be inconsistent with one another. However, there are several potential objections to this consistency claim. Here's one that seems particularly pressing. It could be argued that if God must create a world, or even um, that God must create this world, then panentheism follows. And panentheism seems to be inconsistent with creation out of nothing. But several things can be said by way of response to this objection. To begin with, Panentheism admits of many different meanings, as we heard yesterday for those who were at that session. The salient issue is whether the Edwardsian version of panentheism is inconsistent with creation out of nothing, and it's difficult to see how it is. For recall that on Edwards' way of thinking, God necessarily continuously creates the world stages that comprise the world out of nothing, con uh, nothing consequent upon his eternal decree to create. This involves the immediate communication or emanation of the creation from God's self ad extra on analogy with the projection of a motion picture onto a cinematic screen. As the output of this creative act, the world is an immaterial creation that is radically dependent on the immediate and continued communications of the divine mind. Now, because these communications are of God, projecting from himself, as it were, to the outside, in God, in the sense of being an ideal world generated in the divine mind according to exemplars, and to God, in divine self-glorification and creaturely remination, the world can be said to exist in God in a way that places the Edwards in view alongside other similar versions of panentheism. But note that Edwards is able to retain a doctrine of creation out of nothing on this scheme because it is a continuous creation. None of the world stages that make up the world persist through time. God's immediate communications are constant as the motion picture is constantly projected onto the silver screen. <laughs> 
Note also that God is the sole cause of all that obtains in the world. So it looks like Edwards is able to hold on to both creation out of nothing alongside a version of panentheism. But this is only because he has a rather exotic metaphysics that enables him to escape the usual worries about the apparent incompatibility of panentheism plus creation out of nothing, worries having to do with the creation of a material world to which God is re related in a way similar to the relation of the soul to the body and human creatures. Okay, to conclude. There may well be other worries in the neighborhood of Edwards' position um, that Edwards' view is um, unable to overcome. My task wasn't to defend Edwards against all comers, but only to show that unlike Aquinas, Edwards' metaphysics commits him to the notion that God has a real relation to creation alongside a robust doctrine of divine aseity. His, possession, his position, rather, is a complex one, and for this reason is able to elide certain objections that may be raised against it, such as the one just raised concerning the relationship between his account of creation out of nothing and his panentheism. I think he's successful in the limited sense that his view of God's real relation to creation, such as we've been able to reconstruct it here, doesn't necessarily imperil divine aseity as he understands it. That doesn't mean that Edwards' view is without cost, however. If Aquinas' position is something like the default position in much classical Christian theism, Edwards' alternative may be seen as one way in which a modified version of classical Christian theism might include both God's real relation to his creatures and a notion of divine aseity. But whether many will find the medicine Edwards offers to be palatable is another matter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Oliver. We do have about 25 minutes for questions and discussion. And I think, Joel, how are we going to do this? So we're recording the Q&A, right? And no one's going to walk them around. People need to be brave and get up and go to a <laughs> mic and pick it up and hold it next to your mouth and, and uh, pose a question uh, for Oliver. Maybe I'll start with the creation project style question. Uh, in your opinion as a theologian, what are we to learn from Edwards as we ourselves wrestle with the question, is God really related to us? Um, I, I mean, I think Edwards has a lot to teach us, um, both about what not to say as well as what to say. And actually, I think both of those can be positive contributions. I mean, I think Edwards is one of those thinkers who, whatever he says on a topic, even if you end up disagreeing with him, helps you to see the issues more clearly. And I think that's, what, that's one of the marks of Edwards' work and one of the reasons why Edwards is, it seems to me, a thinker of the first rank, that he does raise the kind of level of pellucidity, um, even if we end up thinking, no, that, oh, we can't go down that road. Nevertheless, we now see more clearly what the issues are. Um, so I'd say there are certain things that Edwards says that we might not want to go with, from my point of view anyway. Panentheism is one of them. I'm not a tr I mean, unless um, I'm feeling a little unwell, I, I don't normally find immaterialism to be um, a, a thesis that um, I'm persuaded by. Um, but those help to make clearer what the issues are and why we might not want to go down that road. On the other hand, it seems to me, um, what Edwards says about um, the importance of preserving a doctrine of creation out of nothing, the importance of preserving God's absolute sovereignty and ultimacy, the, the importance of seeing um, the big picture in terms of what God's ending creation is and why he creates and how it is that we're caught up in the divine life. Those sorts of things are important and positive uh, contributions. On the question of the real relation issue, I suppose much depends on just how classical you want to go in your theism. I mean, if you're persuaded by a kind of Thomistic picture, then I guess that much of what Edwards says will, will leave you unmoved. If, however, you're the kind of person um, who's more attracted to a, a more modified uh, version of, of Christian theism, um, something like a theistic Persism, or some, some people call a kind of neoclassical version of uh, theism, then 
Uh, and you, you have the kind of worries that I started off with, the worries that people like William Lane Craig and um, Catherine LeCugna have. Then you might think, well, hey, here's, here's an interlocutor who's, who might have resources that might help me think about um, how it is that God may be really related to created order, and yet um, helps me also to think about uh, how I can say that without necessarily eroding this notion of God um, being ultimate and um, independent and so on. On that point, it, I got the feeling that at the beginning of your response, you were saying, yeah, mainly we can learn from Edward's mistakes, yeah. but there's nothing else he offers us that you can't get better by looking at other people in, in the tradition. But then at the end, it seemed like you were gesturing toward maybe there's something yeah. about, Edwards, what's, what, with, about what Edwards is doing with real relations yeah. that maybe we don't want to replicate, but we can learn something important yes, from. Yes, that's right. I think that's right. Yeah. I like classical theism, but like a, no, a lot of people these days, I worry a little bit about some central tenets of classical theism. Um, such as divine simplicity and, in this case, the question of the real relations, just because it seems so counterintuitive. I mean, at the beginning, I started off by saying if God doesn't have a real relation to us, then Christ doesn't have a real relation to his mother. God, strictly speaking, doesn't have the relation of being our creator. I mean, that is very weird. And it seems to be counterintuitive for people who read scripture. Um, those things weigh heavily upon me, and I think um, they're... In that case, Edwards might have some resources that, that may be helpful. Do you know yet what you want to say about those things? Do, <laughs> do, does Oliver Crisp think well, this God is, is of, really related to us? <laughs> this is the first step um, towards saying something more constructive. I often find myself, when I'm trying to think about a topic, going to people in the tradition and sort of interrogating my dead friends, as I call, it, call them, um, to say, well, what do you think about this? And, uh, of course, Edwards is someone who I spend a lot of time with, perhaps some members of my family might think too much time with. Um, and uh, so here's, here's, an, here's uh, an issue that I'm ruminating on. Go to Edwards and, and perhaps a little bit of Thomas and think about these things as two different interlocutors. What's my view? Well, I guess I'm more attracted to the Edwardsian than the Thomist view on this. But I, and I think that's important because it has all kinds of trickle-down effects on what other things you might want to say about God. On this specific matter of real relations, I'm not attracted to immaterialism or anti-realism, but I'm attracted to this particular thing. Yeah. We have a question here. Thanks for this. This is wonderful. Um, so I have a question for you about just a, a question of Edwards' interpretation, like how do I understand Edwards on this? Yeah. And it's depending on how the response comes, maybe a worry too. So I'll just state both. Okay. Um, so here's the, the question of Edwards' interpretation. When you talk about Edwards' view that creation is necessary for God, yeah. You know, um, and Edwards' own view of divine compatibilism. Yeah. Is, that could be, be taken to mean some kind of world, maybe a world with sentient creatures who can praise God and all, is necessary for God. Or it could be taken to mean, um, especially depending on how, how hard one presses on the compatibilism piece, it could be, be taken to mean that a particular world is necessary for God. Yeah. And the question is that I have is which which is the right way to take Edwards? The worry I have is if well I have worries either way, but I, the real worry is that I, if if it's this one, how is Edwards how is his view any different than just good old fashioned fatalism? I mean it looks like modal collapse. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, good question. Um, of course. Uh, there are a number of Edwards scholars in the, in the room, and we don't necessarily all agree amongst ourselves, so I'm sure that there are other uh, experts who could give you a different view uh, sitting right here. But um, in terms of my own understanding of Edwards, uh, it seems to me that Edwards is committed to the stronger of those two claims. That is to say, I think that Edwards holds both that God must create a world and also God must create this world. And in fact, in some of his uh, later um, notebooks that have recently been published on the... Um, digital version of the Edwards works on uh, the Jonathan Edwards Center at Yale, uh, in um, some of his work on the Book of Controversies, he seems to come out in a way that sounds sympathetic to a kind of Leibnizian notion of the best possible world, so that um, you know, God doesn't simply have to create a world, but he has to create this world because it turns out this is something like the best possible world. I mean, he doesn't use that kind of, he doesn't use Leibniz's language, but um, he does talk in those sorts of terms. Um, I agree with you that there are worries 
there are real worries in the neighborhood of either of those, either the weaker necessity claim, like God must create a world, or the stronger necessity claim, God must create this world. Um, and um, that's why I'm not really attracted to that view myself. <laughs> yeah. Looks like we have a different question coming. Could you say a little bit more about which uh, metaphysical views of Edwards that you discussed are necessary for the kind of constructive uh, appropriation you mentioned at the end to the effect that we could see in Edwards a kind of modified classical theism in which God exists, uh, say, but still has a real relation to the world. Like, for example, the occasionalism, is that an integral part of the constructive takeaway, or is, yeah. is that separable? Or Yeah, good. So, um, like many Christian theologians who thought deeply about these matters, um, I guess you might think of Edwards's understanding of God and God's relationship to creation as a kind of metaphysical package deal. Right? It's got these various component parts that he thinks fit together into a larger coherent whole. Um, that's obviously clearly the case with someone like Thomas, but, but I think it's also the case with Edwards. It's just he doesn't write summa in which he sort of sets out his views. His, his views are more um, piecemeal. Um, so one question you've got to figure out when you start looking at Edwards like uh, you, like looking at any historic theologian when you're trying to think about the kind of deep structures of their thought is, as I, as I try and understand the kind of metaphysical package here, I need to figure out what's fundamental and what's more peripheral. You know, like in the sciences, you talk about research program where you've got kind of core theses and then you've got sort of these ancillary theses that can be modified, but you've got to keep the core for the research program to be a viable one. So similarly with Edwards, you've got sort of like core concepts and then you've got these ancillary concepts. Maybe some of those can be swapped out, but what's the core and is that a hard core that you can't change without somehow disrupting something fundamental to his metaphysics or his, his kind of the kind of deep theology that he's trying to do? Um, and I suppose I, my own work has been deeply influenced by Edwards, although more recently, I've come to disagree with Edwards on a number of important matters, but it's been a slow and painful process to end up disagreeing with the master, so to speak, right? Um, and I hope that a lot of the, the ways that I approach these things have, have kind of clear um, Edwardsian markers. You know, we can tell this guy's been reading Edwards sort of thing. I think that's a virtue rather than a vice. Some people might think differently, of course. Um, but in answer to your question, what about Edwards' thought here can we take away what, what um, can we leave behind? That depends on a judgment about what's, per, what's on the kind of ancillary belt of um, theses and what's kind of part of the conceptual hardcore. Now, I want to say, I think Edwards has some helpful things to say about God's real relation to creation uh, with respect to the, 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 these related issues that um, Thomas worries about. Does that require me, in addition, to hold to things like his broader immaterialist picture, uh, to hold to his doctrine of uh, causation that includes occasionism and so on? I don't think so. I don't think it does. So I think that you can, you can th drop those out of the discussion and still keep um, your eyes focused on the question of God, the nature of God, God's relationship to creation, and um, how we can hang on to a, a concept of God that includes his independence of creation whilst he is really related to the creator door. And I think that's where his contribution may be useful. So these other, these other bits you need in order to understand what Edwards is saying so that we don't misunderstand Edwards. But constructively speaking, from my point of view, these other things need to drop out in order for us to retrieve aspects of Edwards' thought that are useful. I mean, I'm not particularly attracted to occasionalism. There are one or two Christian philosophers who are beginning to uh, voice views that they think some version of occasionally may be a way to go, but I'm not particularly sympathetic to that. Thanks. Um, so thanks for the talk. Uh, I had one kind of, I guess, clarifying question. Uh, maybe I missed it. I was hoping if you, you could clarify the difference of 
maybe definitions of relation in both Thomas and, and Edwards, because I know Thomas's denial of real relations is, is dependent on his very particular definition of what a real relation is, and I, I yeah. might have missed yeah. what a relation is in Edwards yeah. correspondingly, so. That yeah, that's good, that's a good point. In fact, when um, a, I, an earlier version of this paper went through the, the um, analytic theology reading group that we have at Fuller, and this, this came up in the Q&A as well. Um, so I did, there's a version of this paper, a longer version, which I thought you poor souls were having to put up with enough as it is. I didn't want to, to make you endure more. That There was a longer version of this paper uh, that had a kind of account of Thomas's threefold distinction uh, in various parts of his work, but particularly the Summa Theologiae, uh, on the different sorts of relations with respect to God and creation and, and how to distinguish them, you know, in good scholastic style, right? There are three distinctions here. Uh, there's a, a relation where both relata are really related to one another. There's a relation where only one of the relata are really related to one another, or the other one is merely conceptual uh, or logically related to the other. And then there's a, there's a third sort of distinction where both are only conceptually related to one another. And so he makes this careful distinction between three sorts um, of relations that he's interested in this particular topic um, and goes through them very carefully and then explains how, in the case of God, he can't be really related from the Godward side to the creation, he can't be really related to the creation because that would tie God to the creation in a way that he thinks imperils both divine simplicity because God can't have any composition in his being and also aseity because God can't be somehow um, tugged on by the created order, you know, beholden to the created, created order in any way because otherwise he ceases to be independent, right? And he goes into this in quite a lot of detail. As I say, I could have said more but it was long enough as it is. Edwards, by contrast, uh, does seem to have a slightly different uh, notion of relation. Um, he's working with a more early modern notion of relation, but he still seems to think, uh, I mean, he still has the basic concept of relation with two different relata, and um, um, they've been bound to, together by whatever the relation is that we're talking about. When it comes to causation in something like uh, the freedom of the will, uh, he says right at the beginning of that treatise, that uh, he's going to talk about causes, that's a kind of relation between a cause and effect, uh, but for the most part, what he really means is an occasional cause rather than a real or efficient cause. Now that, I think, is a significant clue um, to how Edwards thinks about the, the causal relationship. Um, and I think that's significant for this discussion precisely because um, if uh, all, all causes in the created order are really the occasions of God's action, then it looks like there really is, a, there's a real relation from the Godward side of things because God is really bringing about these things in the created order. He's really immediately causing everything that happens. And, you know, like my raising my arm here, it feels like I'm causing it. On Edwards' view, I'm not causing it. Rather, it's the occasion for God to bring it about. Right? God does all the movement of my arm, um, I'm not actually, strictly speaking, the cause, but merely the occasion of God's action. Now, that looks to me like Edwards is committed to a notion of relation on the particular matter of causation that involves a real relation from the Godward side of things. I'm hesitating <clears throat> to ask this question because I don't want this to turn into an inside baseball kind of <laughs> conversation about Edwards. Yeah. Um, Oliver knows I don't think Edwards was an anti-realist. I think he was a yeah. realist, and I don't want yeah. to debate that here. But, yeah. I, but I'm, I'm wondering, let's, let's assume for the sake of our discussion here that you're right <laughs> and Edwards was an anti-realist. How are we to understand then the things that Edward says, particularly about the doctrines of original sin and justification when he's teaching the Bible to people, uh, like the human race really is one ontologically in Adam, yeah. or the redeemed really are one in their relation, which is a real relation yeah. with Christ, yeah. or what is legal or forensic in these doctrines is always grounded in what is real. Yeah. How does that all fit together? Was he, is this the Perry Miller thing where he, he's a weird genius in private <laughs> and when he says this other stuff he's just sort of condescending to the vulgar as a Bible preacher? Or? Yeah, 
good, yeah. Um, I'm attracted to all that stuff in Edwards. I mean, all the stuff about real unions in Edwards, I've basically stolen all that from Edwards in my own constructive work. So anybody who's read, say, for example, my work at The Word in Flesh, which is about the person work of Christ, the account of the atonement there, an account of union between Christ and, uh, and us and Adam and the rest of humanity, that's all clearly stolen from Jonathan Edwards. Um, and um, why not? I mean, he's got some great ideas. Um, on this question of anti-realism, though, well, the anti-realism is, is anti-real in this very specific sense that on the way that I'm reading Edwards, uh, everything exists as, um, as a set of stable ideas, as Edwards puts it, in the divine mind, uh, and as projections out of the divine mind, communications, immediate communications out of the divine mind. So it's not merely that, um, as some people might say, uh, Edwards has an anti-realist view in that he thinks that the truth of the world around us is dependent on some mind. It's mind dependent, you know, like we're constructing meaning or something like that. It's not that. It's rather that everything exists, everything that exists in the world around us is dependent for its existence immediately upon God and God thinking about us. So you might paraphrase Edwards in this way. If God stopped thinking about us, we would cease to exist. Right? That's the kind of idea. Um, so then when Edwards talks about, in the original sin, about real relations between Adam and his progeny, real relations between us and Christ and so on, what I think he means is, yeah, those are real in the sense that God thinks about them in that way. And since God makes truth in this matter, as you heard me say in quoting Edwards earlier, there's nothing more to be said about it because there's nothing more fundamental than God thinking about these things in this particular way. There's nothing, as it were, to further ground these claims other than God thinks about it this way. So they're real in the sense that God thinks about them this way. If you ask, well, surely something can be real in a way that God doesn't think about it, it was just going to look at you in a puzzled way and say, what could be more fundamental or more real than God thinking about them? Yes, Mark. I was wondering if you could tease out the simplicity side of this just a bit more. So you mentioned at the beginning that Thomas denies real relation between God and creation to defend both the independence of the creator yeah. and because of his commitment to simplicity. Yeah. You spent a fair bit of time talking about how Edwards does on the independence yeah. Yeah. side of that. Um, so what are the implications of Edwards on real relations for his account of simplicity, which I, I know you have questions about the coherence of his view of simplicity yeah. itself. But. Good. So... Um, on the Thomistic side of things, uh, I take it that Thomas has a, a pretty high um, or pretty robust account of divine simplicity according to which there is no metaphysical composition God whatsoever. So that when we predicate certain things of God, we say God is good, we say God is loving, we say God is holy, we say God is powerful. Those predicates don't actually pick out properties, distinct properties that exist in God, like the property crisp has a certain weight, mass, and so on, actually pick out real things about God that are, uh, uh, crisp rather, that are distinct in crisp, right? Don't confuse God and crisp. That's important. Um, no, says uh, Thomas, in, in God, there, are, there is no such distinction. All these things are one in God. So that our predicating things of God don't actually, as it were, land in the divine age. They don't pick out real distinctions in, on the Godward side of things. That's what it is on his view for God to be Simple. So it's a very strong doctrine of divine simplicity. Uh, and it's also bound up with a related notion of God being a pure act that I won't go into right now. But there, there's, this is another kind of metaphysical package, if you, if you like, which is why a lot of people are attracted to Thomism, because it's this, this kind of beautiful picture of God. And once you get a grip on the metaphysics, it's kind of entrancing. You know, there's something very attractive about it. Now, um, Edwards. There's a dispute in Edwards studies, as you know, of course. Some Edwardsians say, oh, Edwards abandoned, he, he grew up being taught Puritan theology and scholastic theology at Yale. But over the course of his career, he gradually began to abandon that and began to start thinking in different terms, terms that are more common in early modern philosophy about dispositions and, and the world being somehow being brought into actuality moment by moment from a dispositional state by God. Um, and so there's a kind of change in Edwards' thought. He never actually says, I've got rid of the old stuff and come in with a new, but you can track this in his thought. There are other people in Edward's studies who say, well, there certainly is change over the course of Edward's career, that's true, 
Um, but it's not clear to us that he rejects wholesale the earlier Puritan scholastic thought that he grew up with um, and then moved over to a different way of thinking about metaphysics, but rather it seems like he's held on to that and made some kind of adjustments, a bit like you, know, you might make adjustments to the ship as you're traveling across the ocean to keep it seaworthy um, as he goes along. So certainly he has adjustments as he goes along, but he seems to think it's in, somehow in continuity with the earlier classical metaphysics, which is basically a, a, a picture that would have been familiar to someone like Thomas. Right? Um, I'm sympathetic to that latter claim. Um, so it seems to me that Edwards does hold to a doctrine of divine simplicity. He says so across his corpus in both published and unpublished writings at each stage of his career. Uh, he never distances himself from, from that tradition right up to the end. Nevertheless, he says things about things like the doctrine of the Trinity, or in this case about creation, which seem to be in a charitable, we can put it in a charitable way, in tension with that claim, right? So his doctrine of the Trinity, it seems to me, is in a, uh, the most charitable in tension with his doctrine of divine simplicity. I mean, I think that if you take his doctrine of the Trinity, which incidentally I think is a kind of highly original account of the Trinity, underreported in contemporary theology, but I think his account of the Trinity is strictly speaking incompatible with his claims about divine simplicity. Um, similarly, here with the real relation stuff, I think if, uh, I mean, Edwards never sat down, as far as I know, and, and worked these things out. But if we were to sit down with Edwards and say, well, look, you seem to suggest that God has a real relation, causally speaking, to the created order, yet you think that God is simple. How can those two things be true? Because it looks like if God's causing all, all these things all the time, then there's something really true of God, these distinct properties in God, but you deny that God has any properties. It would be interesting to see what Edwards has to say about that. I'm not exactly sure what he would say, but it certainly seems to me that there is a tension in his thought there um, in order to hold on to what Edwards wants to say about God's relation to the creation, um, causally speaking, my guess is that you'd have to revise the doctrine of simplicity accordingly. You'd have to have a weaker account of simplicity. You might not necessarily have to jettison simplicity altogether. This is now Crisp trying to do some repair work to Edwards, not, not me sort of commenting on, it, on Edwards. Um, but maybe you could have a model of divine simplicity, some account of divine simplicity, where God is metaphysically simple, but uh, he may have sort of different properties or different states or something like that. So it's a significantly weaker account of divine simplicity than you have in someone like Thomas, but then you'd, you'd have an account of simplicity that might be compatible with something like real relation, a real relation to creation. But that's me speculating. Sadly, we are out of time. Thank you all for coming very much, and special thanks to Oliver for a stimulating lecture. Would you join me in thanking him publicly? Thank you.